Hi, this is Brad Anderson. I'm the director of the movie you're about to watch, The Machinist, providing witty and, and interesting banter. Uh, this movie was shot um, in 2003 uh, in Barcelona, Spain, of all places. It was uh, it was a script written by by Scott Kosar. It was his first script. He wrote it as a spec just out of film school. And it had been floating around Los Angeles for some time. A lot of producers were interested in the writing. I think they found the subject matter a little too dark. So when I got attached, we, we tried to find the money in America, but ultimately had to go over to Europe to make the film. It tells you a little bit about the American film, the American independent film industry, that we had to make the movie in Spain. It's the first movie I directed that I didn't write, but I, I thought the script was so dark and so creepy and cool that I had to make it. This is where we introduced Christian Bale. I wanted to open the movie with one long, kind of a couple slow, single long shots to just establish the the more kind of languid pacing of the story. It's not a it's not a typical thriller in the sense there's a cut every two seconds and there's a rock and roll soundtrack. It's it's more of an old school, old fashioned kind of feeling movie. I think the score you're hearing. Uh, was written by Rocky Banos, a Spanish composer, based a lot on. I think our inspirations were 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 uh, Bernard Herrmann, probably more than anything. We watched a lot of old Hitchcock films in which he did the scores for, and uh, thought I thought that that kind of music, spooky yet yet emotional, would would be appropriate for this story. The thing I liked about Scott's script is it just sort of took us right into the story. There's not a lot of setup. We just began with what we'll learn by the end of the movie is the end of the story. And it kind of creates immediately this this strange, disconcerting feeling of not really knowing what's going on. So like a lot of these kind of mystery puzzle-type stories... It slowly unfolds clue by clue so that by the end of it you realize what it all means. This was Trevor's apartment. We shot this in a very hot uh, warehouse outside of Barcelona. We built his apartment. I wanted it to be very kind of just dark and uh, kind of creepy and sort of something like like an apartment like a grandmother's apartment that just had gone to seed and uh the production designer Alain Benny a French production designer uh, watched a lot of 1940s films in in, ter in terms of trying to be inspired uh for the production design of the movie So that now on that cut we actually go back to the beginning of our story. What we just everything we just saw was was the end of the movie, um, or at least close to the end of the movie. Now we've magically returned to the beginning, and the way we know that, if you're if you're very perceptive, is uh, Christian doesn't have a scar on his face anymore, which he did in the first few shots. This is one of my favorite shots in the movie. I just love the. When you first open on that image, you don't know what you're looking at. It looks like some kind of, I don't know, uh, like a like a monster or something. And uh, then he raises his head and he realizes he's a human being. Here's where a lot of people, when they first see the film, kind of draws, hit the ground. They see Christian Bale you okay? right here in all his 110-pound uh, glory. He lost 63 pounds for this movie it might be a record actually this shot right here which was his idea to really play up the gruesome look you know i think his weight loss was a big kind of part of this story uh Trevor. it was it was really important because i think it sets up 
immediately the the question of like why is he this way? Why does he look so emaciated? Why is he so tormented? And of course that sort of begs the question uh, why? And you set out on a on a journey to sort of to to answer that question and sort of as he does in the movie. Here we learn that Jennifer Jason Lee's character Stevie is a is a prostitute with a simple one shot of money going into a jar. And the reason the movie is called The Machinist. Here he is at his machine. This was an actual machine shop just outside of Barcelona in an old industrial area. I think one of the advantages we had shooting it there in the end was that we couldn't have found something like this in L.A. Um, we could have ma- designed it and made it as a set, but it would have cost a fortune. This is the real thing. All these old machines from the, the four- 30s and 40s, beat up old funky looking machines it it was perfect um even the lighting you know with that cold fluorescent light and all that just worked really nicely i thought why is that machine down michael ironside uh, an actor i've always admired uh it's very happy to get him in the movie you'll learn later uh, you'll you'll see later when he loses an arm in an industrial accident one of the I think this might be the third or fourth film in which his character loses a limb. Um, Total Recall was one, and I think there were a couple others. Starship Troopers, I think. So uh, maybe it's in his contract that he has to lose an arm for each movie. I'm not sure. A lot of the character actors, like this guy, they were mostly British or a lot of American expats or British expats living in Barcelona. We couldn't afford to hire a, a, Mar- a lot of American actors. It was too expensive to fly them to Spain, so we we hired local actors who could speak English, obviously. The producers originally wanted to hire a lot more Spanish actors and dub their accents out by dubbing in American accents. But I'd seen that done before, and I resisted it. I, it, I knew it would look really bad, so we, we, look, we, we worked hard to find as many American or... Brits who could speak with American accents to fill in a lot of these smaller parts. This guy, Larry Gilliard, has been in a couple movies I've done. Really great actor. This was shot at a locker room in the amusement park that we shot some later scenes at. And kind of converted it into it was a pristine, perfectly clean, antiseptic-looking you know, uh, locker room, so we had to dumb it down and dirty it down and make it look like some crappy machine shop, factory, you know, locker room. This next shot I really like, too. It's just very... It sort of captures the dreamy quality of the movie, I think, the symmetry of it and the just the way he's isolated in the frame, and then just sort of suddenly this woman, this character, enters in abruptly. You okay? And here we're suddenly transported to this very strange world, this airport coffee shop where he seems to go and converse with this, this waitress there. And, I don't know. You know, it's just a strange... Uh, I always liked it, and it always struck me as one of the more interesting things about the script. Like, why does he hang out at this airport coffee shop? So we tried to make it. We actually shot at the Barcelona airport. It was miserable. We were shooting there. We could only shoot between, like, midnight and 4 in the morning. But we built a little coffee shop in the middle of the airport because I wanted to capture the... I don't think we could have built a set, an airport set. It would have been out of our budget, but... We definitely wanted to create uh, this large, empty space. The idea of an airport at, like, 3 in the morning, what's it like? It's so lonely. There's just, you know, uh, passengers, uh, you know, waiting for their flights, sleeping on benches. It just it seemed to capture the insomnia aspect of the story. When you wear graveyard, as long as I have, you get to know the type. Hey. This woman, Aitana Sanchez Quijon, is a fairly well-established um, Spanish actress. She hasn't done much in the States. But, uh, you know, I, I wanted to put a Spanish actress in this role, and uh, 
She was just so lovely and um, really great. That little plane you see in the background is a digital effect. <laughs> we don't have a lot of digital effects in the movies, but we added a few little details here and there to kind of uh, amp up, you know, a scene or to, you know, amp up the drama in a scene. There's the set. There's the airport uh, coffee shop set. Here, the industrial zone outside of Barcelona where we uh, shot a lot of the movie um, hasn't changed in, you know, probably 100 years. It was really cool. Again, we see the uh, the extent uh, or the length that uh, an actor like Christian Bale will go to to assume a role. I mean, you just look at him here and you can see his ribs popping out, his collarbone sticking out. I mean, it's... It's really dramatic, and uh, I didn't ask him to lose this much weight. I should just say, he, I knew he had to. I knew he knew, and I knew that he had to lose a little weight. His character was described as a walking skeleton. And there you go. You can see it. But um, I think if I had asked him to lose 63 pounds, he would have <laughs> walked out of the room. He did it on his own. He 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 knew that he he wanted to push himself, and I think he intended to maybe lose 30 pounds or something. But once he got into it, he just kept going, and by the end of it, he lost a third of his body weight. You can see these little numbers of the weight loss on the post-it notes. I mean, those were actually an accurate reflection of how much weight he had lost. This was to kind of establish that there was something wrong with this man. He spends his evenings not sleeping. He spends his evenings pouring bleach on his bathroom floor and cleaning it with a toothbrush. I mean... There's a certain routine he's established, which is pathological and strange. And uh, I think the idea was to, if you hadn't guessed already, uh, let you know that things are not all right with this man, you know. That shot there is pretty dramatic. The lighting in the movie is very, you know, that shot, like, the guy, Chavi Jimenez, who shot, he's a Spanish DP, very particular style, he uses a lot of top light, a lot of harsh key lights, doesn't use a lot of fill or reflections, reflected light to fill in the dark shadows, and you get this very contrasty kind of look, which, in my mind, is appropriate for this movie. The distinction between the light areas and the dark areas is so dramatic that uh, it captures, I think, the psychology of the character somehow. He couldn't make it. I love the look of this with all those fluorescents built up in the background. I think it's it looks lovely. There's absolutely nothing to worry about. And I'll just get back to work. Uh, Trevor, not yet. This was the the real office in the machine shop we was shot at. It was just so great. It was. This, uh, you couldn't create this kind of production design. This location was one of my favorites. It was just, uh, it wasn't the same factory that we shot at. It was another part of town, but this, the, the compositions of this back parking lot with the smokestacks and the, the corrugated metal buildings, it just captured the uh, impersonal kind of generic look that we were going for. This is supposed to be set in some American city, probably L.A., could be some West Coast city. But I never wanted it to be specific. I never wanted it, the look to tell you exactly where the movie was set. So in all the production design and everything else, we we pulled out and all those indicators that told you where, this, where the story was um, set. And uh, what you get, I think, is this very alienated quality. You're not sure where it takes place. You're not even sure when it takes place. It has a kind of timeless quality to it as well. Look like rain. This is our first uh, introduction of the character Ivan, who we'll learn later is, uh, assuming you've all seen the movie now, um, is really a, a figment of Trevor's imagination and kind of a manifestation of his guilty conscience, if you will. The character playing this, uh, or the actor playing this character, is uh, an American actor who was living in London, I, uh, John Sherian, 
and uh, I really just loved what he did in the audition, and he had such a unique look. Many people say he, remi he reminds them of Brando in Apocalypse Now. <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious. I work in a pit. That was more of an unintentional thing. I just liked the fact that he had such a unique look and had such an interesting take on the character. There's something believable about him, and there's also something totally implausible about this guy. So you're not sure, is he real, is he not? I mean, this shot kind of sums it up right here. I mean, it's it's strange. It's weird, this guy just staring at you and through the window, uh, wearing the, the sunglasses and the leather jacket, the bald head. This is one shot, I'll admit, was pulled directly out of Psycho. There's a shot where Janet Lee is fleeing the scene. Uh, before she gets to the Bates Motel, where a cop pulls her over, and you know she she, w she wakes up and looks out the window, and there's this guy staring at her with these big uh, these big dark shades, and uh, I just that is always a very creepy, disconcerting kind of shot. So we kind of pulled it and used it in The Machinist, it, the one real obvious reference in the movie, I'd say. In the original cut of the movie, we, we went directly from that scene we just saw to the scene where Michael Ironside loses his arm in the industrial accident. And then we cut to this scene of uh, Stevie and Trevor in bed. But, you know, in looking at it, and you know, as you always do, in the editing room, you're always fiddling around the scenes, juggling scenes, seeing what works best. just didn't feel right. It, it, his, rea his, his reaction here, this would have been post-accident, just felt too blasé. So we shifted it. We just shuffled those scenes around. I haven't slept in a year. <laughs> Many people question that statement, and you know, of course, it's true. You can't survive uh, without sleep for a year. It's it's physically impossible. But the idea is more that he thinks. He hasn't slept in a year. He's, um, and that's true. There are many people who claim they haven't slept in a year, if not years. In fact, they do sleep. Their brain shuts down. They're called micro sleeps, and your brain shuts down without you really being aware of it. You enter into the REM state without being conscious of it, um, and then wake back up and thinking the whole time you've been awake and conscious, and you haven't. And uh, so you kind of become almost like a, a, a a zombie, and I think maybe that's if you want to describe what what Trevor's uh, physiological condition is. That that's probably the most accurate way of putting it. He has severe insomnia. He does sleep, and probably when he sleeps, he has th these these delusional scenes in the film. You know, the scenes with Ivan and the scenes with the uh, the waitress at the airport coffee shop. This was one of the more difficult scenes to shoot. This is the bit where he loses his arm. You know, originally we were going to really see the the whole deal with all the all the gore and you know really play it up. Uh, the prosthetic arm they had devised uh, for Michael that would get pulled into the machine and pulled off, and there'd be all sorts of blood spilling out. Really didn't work too well, so. We kind of faked it. It really is. A, it becomes more about the lead up to the uh, to the arm getting uh, cut off, and and the actual accident itself, the actual severing of the arm, becomes just like you know one three second cut or something, um, which is probably probably all for the best. Again, a little digital effect we added here. That kind of rippling heat ripple that wasn't in, we didn't couldn't create that in reality, so we added it digitally to kind of make the shot a little more dreamlike. Hey, what did you do? The sound design, I think, the sound designers did quite a good job at capturing the, the menacing uh, nature of, of certain scenes, especially a scene like this. All the different uh, sound effects, the squealing, screeching uh, drill bit, the, the low rumble and the screams and and here's your three-second prosthetic arm cut. 
And you can hear that even the, the even the flapping of what you hear in the back. You can't quite see it, but the flapping of the arm against the post, uh, which we see in a bit, just establishing the sound of that before you actually see it. I thought it was pretty pretty good. There you go. Here's a here's a real Bernard Herman psycho refrain here, you know. And of course he looks over and Ivan's there. I mean, you know, I think when people watch the film, they they guess pretty early that Ivan is is probably not a real character, but but there's some doubt even up to the very end. You know, I think you're never exactly sure, but you know, obviously at the very end you realize that he is a figment of Trevor's imagination. One hundred and nineteen pounds. In fact, I think Christian got down to one hundred and ten, if I'm not mistaken. This was Christian's probably favorite scene, I think, because he got to chow down on chicken wings for three or four takes. <laughs> he didn't really eat that much when we were making the movie. He would occasionally gnaw on an apple, or he'd smoke a lot. I think that you know kind of reduced his appetite. Although he says he enjoyed it, he says he actually um, kind of enjoyed the process. He it kind of put him into almost this euphoric, zen-like state, being so underweight. And here we we bring in the 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 post-it note hangman through line, you know, and um, which was you know something in the script that visually that I thought I just liked. It just seems so. Such an iconic image that captured the, the dark humor, but also the puzzle nature of the story. Good night, Mr. Resnick. Uh, Mr. Anna Massey. She is a very well established, well known British character actor. She was in a Hitchcock film. In fact, she was in Frenzy. She got killed in Frenzy, and she almost got killed in Peeping Tom, uh, another film that she was in. And I kind of like the fact that we cast her because there is a Hitchcock vibe to the movie, I think. And uh, the fact that she is a bit of a peeping Tom herself, this sort of nosy landlady, um, seemed appropriate. It's kind of the same character she played in Peeping Tom, actually. She was great. She's a wonderful actress. One. Miller was operating. Another one of my favorite shots is this really. Nice wide shot here with the fluorescence above and the f sparking outside the window. I just think it's really, Chavi did an amazing job, particularly with the wide shots, which we tried to do as much as possible to open up the movie and, uh, and such. I didn't want it to be so claustrophobic. That image there, it's a subtle thing, but those three severed fingers are, are an image that matches precisely the three smokestacks on the factory near which he disposes of Ivan's body at the end of the movie. Subtle things, you know, little things that you pick up on the third or fourth viewing. These guys had a nice little rapport, these two actors who played the, the boss and the, the foreman kind of added some nice little character beats. His wardrobe here, I think, was, was I inspired. It, it really reminded me. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Cabin of Dr. Caligari, but there's a character in that who's kind of this sleepwalker character. And uh, he wears that kind of black turtleneck thing. And he's also a very thin, gangly character. And there were a few shots in the movie also at the beginning uh, when he's disposing of the body. We were trying to kind of capture that that German expressionist uh, kind of posturing and um, in the acting and you know, also in the in the look of the movie and he, some, some of the really severe angles um, I think was also moving in that direction. We did watch a lot of those films you know, the Nosferatu, The Cabin of Dr. Caligari um, just to kind of get inspired I think.
We keep returning to the, uh, you know, the, the, the iconic image of the cigarette lighter, you know, which doesn't really strike us at, at the time as to having any significance. But later on, it, it really is sort of the, the reason why he has the accident at the end. He's distracted and lighting his cigarette. So there, there's all these little moments throughout the story where he's getting pinged, you know, his, his memory is getting pinged. Again, here's a bigger one where he sort of finds himself frozen in the center of this intersection. Strange. And, you know, later, by the end of the movie, you realize this is the intersection where the accident occurred. It's all... The memories are coming back in bits and pieces, but he's still not putting together... He's not seeing... He doesn't have the distance to see the, the whole picture, you know. Again, another image, just simple image that I think says a lot. Uh, that water tower, which which marks the the intersection where the accident occurred. It, it pops up a few times in the movie. It wasn't in the script. There was no indication in the script. There was no description in the script ab about the intersection itself, but I, I needed to... I needed to familiarize the audience with it, so by the end they understood that this was the same intersection where the accident occurs. So by putting that very uh, familiar-looking water tower in uh, in those scenes, it, it sort of marks the intersection. Yeah. But they will when they find out who I am. Oh, really? Who are you? You keep a secret. This is one of the few beats where Trevor... Uh, shows his more charming kind of goofy side you kind of wonder what this guy was like before the accident before um his life kind of fell apart there's a few little beats in here where you might understand what this character was like that he that he had a personality that he was uh charming that he had a certain gallantry with women a little guilt goes a long way. One of my favorite lines in the movie, a little guilt goes a long way, it kind of sums it up, doesn't it? I think it was a line I really wanted to use on the poster for the marketing campaign. But uh, I think the uh, you know marketing execs at, at Paramount wanted something a little more, I don't know, on the nose, I guess. So it became, uh, how do you wake up from a nightmare if you're not asleep? But, a, but the movie is, is a, you know, it's it's a meditation on guilt, really. I mean, it's a parable about guilt. And the man who finally has to fess up to his crime at the end, I mean, I felt that by in marketing the film, we should make that clear. I didn't want it to come across as a horror movie, you know. I think there are horror elements in it. But to me, it's much more a, a dark drama a la... Kafka, maybe, about guilt than it is a horror movie about a man being sort of haunted by his uh, his past. This is a nice little... I love the score here, this sort of bass clarinet or whatever it is. It's very... It's just sort of melancholy in the movie that I think the score captures nicely. A sadness. This is guy is a... He's a pretty lonely guy, you know? And, uh... I think his loneliness is something that the audience can relate to, and, and it kind of humanizes him a little bit. And I think those scenes, scenes like that, help in that direction. Armed robbery? Oh, yeah, that's right. Because me and Jackson had you pegged as a pedophile. Ain't that right, Jackson? <laughs> You're probably guilty of that too. Hey, I don't see what's so fucking funny. This guy's great, Reg Kathy. He's uh, you might remember him from Oz. He was one of the actors on Oz, but uh, a real strong. Presence. Make me nervous. You look like shit, acting all crazy. What's up with you? Nothing's up with me. It was an accident. I'm the one who's got to live with it, not you. Christian's one of those actors that, you know, he does this impeccable American accent in the movie, as he's done in other films. But, uh, you know, he's from Wales, uh, born and bred. Um, he lives in L.A. now, but, I mean... He really just becomes, like, like I said earlier, he really becomes the character. And in this case, not only losing the weight, but he's one of those actors that also kind of stays in character off set, you know. 
So he spoke with an American accent throughout the making of the movie, and literally the moment we wrapped, he went back. He like he just slipped right back into his British accent. It was interesting. The red car. I mean, you know, this is really the, the most prominent color in the movie. Obviously, the, the, we, we leached out a lot of the colors. It's it's a really a monochromatic film. That shot right there kind of sums up the look of the movie. But the car, you know, was, uh, in my mind, it's like the thing that's luring him closer and closer to his epiphany. So the color of it, um, I thought the idea of it being this sort of red, warning, cautionary color, but also... Uh, a color that um, we associate with blood, with danger. I mean, it just seemed like the, uh, if we're going to have a color really pop in the movie, that should be the one. It's Militon. Woo! <laughs> we need to talk. We created the look in post production. We shot the film in 35 millimeter, but then we dumped everything to um, high definition digital and. Um, and it was then that we, we fussed with the color and took it out and, you know, kind of came up with the this, this look for the film. And there again, we, we see that we're at that intersection. There's that tower looming in the background. This was a difficult scene uh, as well. This was shot at a tiny little bar in back streets of Barcelona. You know, again, four in the morning, whatever. Hot as sin in there. It was, it was, we shot the film in the middle of the summer in Spain, and, you know, not a good thing to do. It was something like, there were days where it was 103, 104 degrees out, and even at night, it was brutal. And uh, in this scene, I remember specifically, this, there was no air conditioning in this little hole in the wall. A bar and I think it was just like a, it was like a, a Finnish sauna in there and between every take you know the makeup girl going up to John and swabbing his brow so you know he doesn't look like he's sweating to death it was it was brutal but you know the testament to these guys you know they, they stuck through it and I like to scene it I think it it captures the perverse humor in the movie. I mean, there is quite a bit of really dark, absurdist humor, and uh, I think Ivan's character, in, in some respects, kind of captures it best. He's kind of like this sinister clown character, and uh, I think that the way that Scott had written him, uh, particularly with this idea that he has this, this deformed hand, or this, this kind of claw-like hand, was kind of inspired. You look like you've seen a ghost. We, we, we kind of did John up a little. I mean, we gave him these prosthetic teeth. Those aren't his real teeth, I should tell you. And, uh, you know, gave him a contact lens so his eyes were different colors and gave him a couple scars, you know, kind of made him look even more bizarre than he does in real life. <laughs> Quit fucking around. A guy lost his arm. He could have died. Now, what we're really seeing here is Christian talking to his, or to Trevor, talking to his his conscience, you know, and you caused the accident. He's sort of looking at a, he's really talking to a reflected image of his own guilty conscience. Hey, where are you going? I mean, Scott, when he wrote the script, I know he was, Take. he was inspired a lot by, uh, the works of Dostoevsky and right Kafka, particularly, I think the Double was a was a uh, was a book that he kept talking about. Um, in fact, it even opens the scene even opens up with Christian saying, "Make it a double," or not with Ivan saying, "Make it a double." You know, Ivan being Christian's double in in a sense. That's what I liked about the script. I think first and foremost was. It had. It felt so literary, you know. It, it felt like its influences were more literary influences than they were cinematic, and uh, I thought that was kind of unusual. We do have some references if you keep your eyes open in the movie to uh, to Dostoevsky in particular. There's a he's reading the idiot in the movie, and 
And there's a scene in the in the amusement park ride where you see uh, crime and punishment on the movie marquee. Now this picture is sort of a a clue that Trevor finds, which he thinks uh, establishes a connection between Ivan and one of the one of his fellow workers, fueling his belief that he's the victim of some conspiracy or plot. Um, what we learn at the end, and there's one one special shot at the end where it, it, it tells you is that you know that's a picture of him and uh, it's a picture of Trevor and and that guy. So you know again he's his his insomnia is is messing with his head and uh, he's he's seeing things more and more as the movie progresses. It becomes more and more a, a kind of he slips more and more into this sort of waking nightmare. A lot of people say at this point they totally, they get the clue or they get the answer to the puzzle being killer, which I, you know, I can understand that. It could be murder as well, I suppose. Which is fine in my mind. I, that doesn't, I don't think this is really a movie that's, that hinges on, uh, that kind of plot device. I think that it's really more told from Trevor's perspective. So if the audience gets ahead of Trevor in that regard, that doesn't bother me. Trevor, I'm not exactly alone. It's really, to me, more fascinating watching this guy struggle with uh, his growing paranoia and how he reacts to it. Um, it might even all, maybe be a good thing that the audience is a little bit ahead of him so that they can kind of anticipate his reactions. Like, how is he going to react to... How, what's he going to tell Stevie in this scene? You're the only one I can talk to. My pleasure. This was shot at a, uh, a big abandoned mental hospital uh, about an hour outside of Barcelona. We, you know, it's, a, it's a location that a lot of Barcelona film, a lot of Spanish film productions use. You know, they build sets there. It's a free location, um, which is funny. If you've ever seen... The film I did prior to this, Session 9, which was shot at a big abandoned mental hospital outside of Boston, it was nice to return to uh, a place that I felt very at home in. <laughs> it's a really creepy place, actually. Uh, they had in the basement uh, stacks and stacks of, uh, you know, patients' records, x-ray photos of patients' heads and very creepy stuff, but... Uh, kind of felt appropriate that we shot scenes from the machinist there. Talker? And here he's starting to, you know, like the audience, trying to, you know, find answers to the puzzle and being led down various wrong paths. They could just fire you. The lighting in this is another, I think the lighting in this particular scene is very luminescent. I think Chavi did a great job. This is a, if you've ever been to Barcelona, if you look up on the surrounding hills, you'll see a, like something that looks like a Walt Disney castle, a Disney World castle. And what that is is a place called Tibidaba, which is a very famous Spanish amusement park, kind of like a little, a little uh, magic kingdom, you know. That was, a, that was one of the hardest locations to kind of nail down. In the original script, which was, again, like I said, set in L.A., this scene went down at the uh, Santa Monica Pier, you know, where they have, you know, all these kinds of rides and such. So we were trying to find the equivalent of something like that. And I think it worked out nicely. It's a very unique location. The problem is it's perched on this hill overlooking Barcelona. So all the shots we had of the of, uh, around the area, we had to shoot kind of low down because if we raised the camera too high up, we would have seen over the hill and the entire city of Barcelona laying down in the valley and uh, it would have given away that we weren't in any kind of American city. So we had to choose our angles very specifically to frame out any indication of where we were in Barcelona. Yeah, no sweat. I'll take Nicholas for a ride. Thanks. It's creepy, and I think if you watch this film again, knowing that this is all, this scene, all these scenes here at the amusement park are all 
Trevor's imagination, that they're all uh, scenes that he is fabricating in his paranoid, sleep-deprived mind. This scene in particular, I mean, here he is taking the little boy he killed on this strange little stroll through this dark tunnel. I mean, I, I just thought it was... It's very perverse, you know. It's it's kind of twisted. That's I think that's what I loved about the script. It, there were moments where I found myself laughing and then moments where I found myself just appalled. What's that? The music, too, here helps, I think, create a very spooky vibe. This little kid was... It was tough finding a little boy to play Nicholas. I mean, how do you direct him when you're basically telling him you're playing... Uh, figment of someone's imagination kids don't quite understand that but he, this kid was good he was a he was a you know the son of a uh, of a spanish and american uh, couple living in madrid so he spoke perfect english and uh it was his first movie of course he got a kick out of it here we are in the route 666 ride which the last scene we shot in the movie. This was the last sequence we shot in the film, which gave us a chance to import uh, images and ideas from earlier scenes we had shot to kind of, again, ping Trevor's guilty conscience. I mean, this one obviously being, you know, Miller's hand <laughs> uh, hanging there in the hand of an Indian. But this was a lot of fun to shoot. It was definitely... Uh, challenging lighting wise and all that we didn't have a lot of time to shoot it we had like a day and a half but it was uh also a lot of fun to cut to edit and uh the sound design especially was something that I, we spent a lot of time here i think we had something like 60 70 tracks of sound design of effects and ambiences and such that we played with in this sequence This is, again, uh, Scott Kosar's twisted imagination. I think at this point you start to realize, this probably isn't happening. I don't know if they would have those kinds of scenes in a children's haunted house ride. And, again, this, I mean, and this is where it really gets a little bit unnerving, is uh, what on earth is that, you know? There are, there are many beats in the film where Trevor is confronted with these this sort of crossed road uh, uh, thing, and it's it's sort of like his choice as to which way he's going to go. There's a scene in the su in the in the subway tunnel towards the end, and then at the very end when he's confronted with whether he's going to go to the airport or whether he's going to go to the police station and turn himself in. And uh, this is a very clear cut one: the road to salvation or the road to hell. This might be a good place to put your CD, your DVD player on slow-mo, and you can watch all the flash cuts, each of them telling us a little bit about the accident, which we'll later see. They built this whole exterior facade um, at the amusement park because uh, they obviously didn't have a Route 666. Hang on, Nicholas. I'm going for help. Nicholas! This beat didn't work quite as well as I had hoped it would have, but there's a this 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 reference between the water tower and that that sort of swing ride in the back. Like there's a similar architecture. The, the two images have that kind of mushroom shape, um, and I was trying to make this parallel between them. That maybe something that was triggering Trevor's little memory there was the shape of the of the ride, but it didn't really pay off. This, oddly enough, was a really difficult scene because uh, we couldn't find a street in Barcelona that that was really a, a side street we could shoot on that wasn't, like, cobblestone or, or had a lot of bumps in it. They just didn't have a smooth road, so we ended up uh, shooting in a really dodgy part of town. If you look behind Trevor, right there, out of focus, are two junkies shooting up heroin. No kidding. We ended, we ended up shooting this in, like the junky part of town in, like, the worst part of Barcelona. I thought that was really funny or kind of actually sad. 
Here we are in uh, Marie's apartment, uh, which if you're really paying attention, uh, you'll realize that this is actually Trevor's apartment. I mean, it's the same set. We just dressed it differently because the idea was that, well, you know, he doesn't know this woman. Um, he's created her out of his own, out of his imagination, so he would probably import ideas and images from his own life and transplant them into her life so also this bowl we learn at the end is something that he owns it's, it's his mother's bowl so all the decor and all the props and everything in this scene in this scene are are things that exist in trevor's actual apartment we just rearrange them and change it around a little bit i mean it's a very subtle thing but This cut that's playing on the record is this very, it's this 1940s, like, theremin music. We we use the theremin in the score, the theremin, of course, being that, that instrument that you play your hands within a magnetic field in order to create that strange electronic sound. Entertainment. You. And, uh... Bernard Herrmann used it quite a bit in some of Hitchcock's scores, and I just wanted to use the theremin in the score. I just thought it was—it's a sound that, in my mind, captured the uh, the creepiness of the movie, but also there was a there's sort of humor in it as well. It's a sort of—it's a strange, funny sound, and it's also kind of a, a haunting sound. So, uh, and I think this might be one of the. First film scores in some time that's used the theremin. Anyhow, I, I found a cut off an old 1940s 45 that that had the theremin in it, so I used it in the movie. It's the only like licensed music I think that we used. The rest is all original score. This little moment here, where he kind of, you know, kind of seems to be remembering something, because this is the hallway, and this is the exact same hallway in his apartment. So it's again that. That deja vu moment, you know, where, hmm, it seems familiar. I'm not sure why, but that light right there, for instance, is the same light in his kitchen. And, you know, it's all kind of very subtle stuff. But, again, we hope that the audiences go and see the movie more than once. But, again, the you know, 1.30, what is the significance of 1.30? All these, these little uh, images and kind of starting to build up now. refrigerator kind of becomes an important element in the story, you know, where a refrigerator being a place where you hang memories of your life and photos and old family photos or whatever they are, notes to jog your memory about getting groceries, that kind of thing. So in my mind, it kind of became the place where Trevor, that in the end will jog his memory. Um, that's where he sees the post-it notes. That's where he, in the end, he thinks, by the end, he thinks that the body of Nicholas is inside the refrigerator. So it becomes a central motif. Here again, now, the, the switch in the color, we went from the kind of warmish color of Marie's apartment. Now we're in the same, now we're in Trevor's apartment. We shift to that kind of blue tone or that monochromatic uh, cold tone to tell the audience that we are in uh, another location now. But I think the idea that it's it's subtle is interesting because in reality we're not. We're in the same location. I mean, Marie's apartment is Trevor's apartment. Um, at least that's the idea. And here for the first time he, he actually tries to solve the puzzle, figure it out. What could it mean? And... Um, he comes up with this solution, which isn't right, but has some significance in the movie. I mean, he tells Marie at the beginning that, you know, he talks about uh, the grief, his grief when his mother died. And and, and here he learns that, uh, he, he discovers that that moment earlier in the amusement park was uh, a moment that, uh, the precise moment that he had as a child with his mother. So what's the connection? The connection is that 
that Trevor is taking his past memories of his youth, for instance, as a boy with his mother and and planting them into these delusional scenes with Marie and Nicholas. And there's the image, the exact same image that when he was taking a photo of Marie and Nicholas in front of the merry-go-round. And here, you know, we make that visual connection like, hmm, I've, I've been there, I've done that, you know. I think Christian was really good at capturing the, this little moment. It was, a, it was just an improv, that, that little smile at the end. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't something I directed, but he felt it was important to show that, you know, the emotional connection that this man had with his uh, mother, with his past. Give him some dimension. Swansea late today. Or Sanchez. That's an irrelevant question, Resnick. I'm asking you. This was a uh, an actual machine. This one here, where he gets his arm, uh, uh, he's about to get his arm caught up in the gears. I mean, we built a piece of it, but we built the gears. But it, it was a real machine. We actually tried the only fake machine in the in the movie was the one is Miller's machine, the one in which. He loses his arm. Again, I love the lighting in this. I just think uh, the way Chavi just uh, captures the, the dark, shadowy areas and the, the kind of sheen, that the fluorescent sheen on everything. Oh, God, no. Where do I begin? Doing this, fi- doing this, this fake arm... Stub on Michael Ironside was a total drag. I mean, we just couldn't, you know. It's not so bad here, but in the scene later at his apart, at his house, it just looks so fake, and I constantly had to cut around it because it was just this this wobbly little fake fabric arm stub that looked totally false. And of course, he had his arm around his back, so it's just it's one of those things. We just didn't have the budget to digitally eliminate Michael Ironside's actual arm as they did in Starship Troopers, I'm sure. We had to do it the old-fashioned way. I'll see you around, pal. I thought Ironside was good here in, in maintaining the the plausibility that maybe Miller is, like, you know, part of the plot and so fueling Trevor's growing paranoia. Now, the question that's not really answered, I suppose, is who turned on the machine? You know, was it, did Miller actually turn on the machine, you know, to cause this potential accident? Um, we had a we had an actual shot of a hand flicking the switch to on, you know, from off to on. But uh, I felt that it should be more ambiguous. Like, maybe the machine just turned on on its own. Maybe maybe Trevor accidentally turned it on, just like he accidentally turned on Miller's machine. I mean, he blames the workers. He blames them for being against him, but maybe he's against himself. I mean, we kept it more ambiguous. We dropped that shot of a hand actually switching on the machine. You're sick, you asshole. You're imagining things again. Oh, yeah? You've been pushing me to How's that? We shot like seven or eight takes of this entire scene with the, the guy with the glasses, Reynolds, here on the, on the left, wearing a white T-shirt. We looked at the dailies, and it was just so bizarre because it just... Everything else is so dark, and then he's this giant man. He's a big man with this big white T-shirt, and it just killed the scene because your eye just went direct just kept going to this to him so we went back and we reshot the whole scene and put him in a black t-shirt so that it was he wasn't so prominent in the frame i mean these are the little things you learn as you make films usually kind of after you've made the mistake Here, 
which have you pushing the envelope in terms of actually having the light in the scene. I mean, he, you know, he really likes to see how far he can go. I mean, he, I think he prefers to shoot a movie with no light at all, if possible. Here's a little reference. You see that yellow, uh, that yellow lamp there. That is the same lamp we see at the beginning that the that the stranger is holding when when he shines it on Trevor as Trevor's disposing the body. And we, of course, learn now by the end that it's Trevor's lamp. I mean, it, again, taking something from his own life and putting it into his delusional scenes. This is setting up that something something's in that refrigerator that's uh, thawing out <laughs> there was a bit that wasn't in the original script I kind of had Scott add that I wanted I wanted to create a little more of suspense around uh, the refrigerator there's another deleted scene that we had here in which Trevor actually talks to the bartender he sort of kind of asks him about have you seen Ivan around um, it just seemed superfluous, so we lost it and just cut directly to him going into the bathroom and getting back into his hand-washing ritual, which is pretty clear cut as to what that means, you know? I love <laughs> the pure lie. I just, I don't know. It's it's on the nose, I know, but I, I kind of like the idea that he washes his, hand with, his hands with something called pure lie. This just happened to be a, a, a mirror that was in this bathroom, this warped mirror, and we just kind of used it to our advantage, I think. kind of works. It's like sees the boots in the, uh, in the warped reflection of the mirror. And this, this scene is the one place where we dubbed in a, an American accent. <laughs> Because the guy had a very thick Catalan accent when he said that line, so we had to dub in it with an American accent. It would have been strange. I guess he, we could have imagined he was a, Mex a Mexican guy, I suppose. But What? Jennifer Jason Lee is an actress that I always wanted to work with. Um, I think we were really lucky to get her. This wasn't a big movie by any stretch of the imagination. Um, uh... But she really loved the script. She certainly wanted to work with Christian. They'd never worked together. And I think she really identified with the role, you know. I mean, of course she plays a prostitute, but she plays a character who we're really not certain of her agenda. And I think the way she was able to balance fueling Trevor's fear that, that uh, he was the victim of some plot and at the same time make this character sympathetic and and heartfelt I think was 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 really interesting what I mean is this is one of the few scenes the, the few real genuinely human uh, scenes in the movie I think I mean human meaning just kind of real and not so disconcerting and uh, just has a, a real sweet quality to it. But it, there's the music also kind of pitches it in a slightly strange direction, I think. You know, it kind of makes it a little bit, a little bit uh, unsettling with that theremin right there, you know. Now, here we're back in Trevor's apartment. Um, by this point in the story, uh, you know, he's lost his job. He's... Uh, you know, he's, his his belief that uh, that someone's out to get him is growing day by day. Uh, he's living really in what Scott described in the script as a serial killer's lair. You know, all the utilities have been cut off. Bugs are in his apartment. I mean, things are falling apart pretty quickly at this point. And you know, from this point on, the, the rest of the movie, the rest of the story, all takes place. Over the course of, I guess you could say, one day, um, from this point all the way to the to the the bit where he has the revelation that uh, of the of what he did in a year earlier you know, by killing the boy. We 
we kind of played this scene for the for the joke a little bit, maybe a little too much. But I'm sorry. I thought you were somebody else. Gave me such a scare. <laughs> Thank you, Anna Massey. She really worked hard at at, at that that kind of. The American accent. She did quite a good job. Originally, she want she 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 auditioned a few other accents she wanted to go for, but I just thought the plain old American accent was best. What's that terrible smell? There's no leak in this apartment now. If you'll excuse me. You sure you're all right, yeah, Mr. Rasmussen? Yeah, I'm Rasmus? sure. Huh? Now, if you need anything, please call first. Here we, you know, you can hear the dripping. Before we see where it's coming from, I like these kind of scenes where you you watch a character react to something off camera, and of course you're just eager to see what it is, and then you show you show the audience what it is, and uh, in this case, <laughs> a, a a bleeding refrigerator. Of course, the question would be like, well, you know, wouldn't Trevor react more to the fact that there's blood pouring out of his refrigerator and less to this little kooky post-it note that's pasted on it? Yeah, but again, I think at this point, you know, he's so bent on on figuring out who's doing this to him that uh, the fact that there's a pool of blood in his kitchen is almost besides the point. It's Miller. Miller's the new culprit. These scenes were shot... Uh, we looked far and wide to find a street that looked like it could be some subdivision or neighborhood uh, around L.A. or somewhere in California. And this was like literally... I think this is maybe the only place in all of Spain that that I felt... I could buy as being an American neighborhood, you know. We dressed it up a bit, and you know, we added the American cars. And the, the thing you don't see in Spain are, are uh, you know, uh, garbage barrels on the street, you know, in front of homes. Um, they have a different garbage disposal system there or whatever. But, uh, so little details like that to try to make it feel more American. Uh, that was one of my challenges. Not only did I have to direct the movie, but I was the since I was the only real American on the set, I had to be the filter. I had to be the the person who determined whether it felt like it it could be America or not. Like all the little, I had to be aware of all the little details, license plates, everything. Eight cylinders, Magnus. Scott, for some reason, rode in a Cadillac Seville. I think that's what this car is. Into the <laughs> script. This is a car that Miller's bought, presumably with the money he got, the compensation money he got. Um, so Scott rode in a Cadillac Seville, and my God, I think we spent weeks scouring the, the you know, the, the, the uh, car collectors around. Uh, Barcelona looking for a Cadillac Seville. They just didn't, it's not like a, they don't sell them in Spain or something. We found one guy who had one, like a collector of American cars. This shot I kind of thought was nice. It's trying to really take advantage of the, uh, the widescreen format. Accidents happen out of negligence. This happened out of spite. Hell, that's some vocabulary you got, kid. Spite. Ill will, vengeance. Vengeance means revenge, Miller. I'm sure you know what revenge means, don't you? I'm on to you, Miller. Despite your I like the background. I think behind Trevor's head, the kind of graphic tools and sharp metal implements create some anxiety in the shot. <laughs> so, of course, you know, Miller's just reacting to the to the fact that this guy's being a real, you know, annoying uh, kind of dick. So it's not you know it's not that that Miller's uh, the culprit. Again, that that the car that that sort of always crops up at in, inopportune moments, luring Trevor closer and closer to. Uh, Final revelation. (laughs) 
These these are difficult sequences too. Uh, anything on the streets because, you know, again shooting in Barcelona. I mean, it, we had to pull out all the European-looking cars, like the Citroens and those tiny little European cars. And like a scene like this, we probably threw in like 20 or 30 American-looking cars. But you know, if you stop your pause your DVD, I'm sure you can see our a few mistakes here and there. But it was difficult. Also, creating this intersection, something that looked like it could be an American intersection, with the hanging st traffic lights, which they don't have in Spain, um, was a bit of a challenge. This was uh, in Andorra. It was a whole. We shot this in an entirely different country, which is about three hours north of Barcelona. It's a mountainous kingdom or principality or nation or something like that. I'm not even sure what Andorra is, but they have all these great tunnels through the mountains, so we found this one tunnel that uh, they let us shoot in. And this is the last day of the shoot, thankfully. You know, it's... It was, like I said, it was a fairly low-budget movie, and doing anything with cars was... Anything with vehicles was really difficult, particularly this Dodge pickup, which, you know, was maybe the only Dodge pickup in all of Spain uh, that broke down probably every other take. I mean, it was just we spent more time trying to restart that truck than we did shooting scenes with it. Sir, this is the DMV, not a dating service. This wasn't an actual DMV, obviously. This was uh, some kind of an athletic association. We converted into <laughs> an American DMV. Uh, I mean, I think you should have brought in more people, more pissed off people, and I think it would have been a more accurate DMV. Looks a little too clean, and they're a little too helpful here, I think. You, know, you usually have the DMV guys wearing, like, white shirts and ties. I think, I don't know what I was thinking. Would you give me an address? No, but the police might. Like, this kid was, like, an American student who was studying in Spain and he had a little acting you know experience so we cast him this scene was tricky I mean you know uh, the scene where he gets hit by the car um, initially we were going to try to do it as a stunt but I wanted it to be a little more dramatic looking than that so we ended up doing it as a digital effect but uh, unfortunately the digital effect houses in Barcelona aren't really probably on par with what they are here in America, so I don't think it never really looks as good as I hoped it would. And I think I played this scene really for the absurd humor in it. I mean, the notion of a guy throwing himself in front of a car on purpose so that he can get some information from the cops is <laughs> it's pretty ridiculous. What is it, sweetie? You tired, huh? You want to go take a nap? We're almost tired. I'd rather be fishing. That's a little inside joke. There's a little bit of a fishing theme in the movie. But that's really because by the end we realize that that's something that Trevor liked to do. I mean, because he's the guy in that photo with the other co-worker holding the fish. I mean, they used to go fishing on weekends, apparently, you know, so it's... Trying to show a little bit about what this guy was like before the accident. He had hobbies. He he did things other than sit around his apartment reading Dostoevsky. Not a real police station. Um, this was some kind of a gym, I think, uh, that we converted. The original wardrobe that they got for the LAPD cops was just so laughably bad. It was like something from a Halloween costume, like plastic badges, and and I just told them there's no way we gotta we gotta get the real thing. So they actually sent away to America to, to the same people who probably provide the wardrobe for you know shows like The Shield or or whatever. And uh, we got like the real LAPD wardrobe. This scene is this is a, this these scenes we shot um, 
in the uh, in the, the 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 police station set that we we created. But this shot, sure about these plate numbers? there's one shot that we did as a pickup shot like months later because we needed a close-up. So we had to replicate the brick behind his head. We had to replicate all the blood streams on his face and the makeup. This shot right here was shot um, like five months after we did the other shot, which is a pretty good match, I think. Not in the same location. It was shot like on a studio somewhere. Matches fairly well. And then now back to the original scene. And now we begin the the crazy kind of wild goose chase bit. Um, hey, wait a minute. I think you have some explaining to do. Which in the original script had had Trevor running into the, you know, down Hollywood Boulevard into the, into the Los Angeles... Subway station. I mean, you know, was all these very specific Los Angeles landmarks that were indicated in the script. And obviously, we couldn't do that because we were shooting the movie in Barcelona. So we just found, again, like generic lo- as sets and lo- or locations that felt just generic. And yeah, you know, I, I think this is probably the the one biggest giveaway that we're not in America. I mean, I don't think the I don't think there's a subway system on the West Coast that looks quite like this. Uh, it's certainly not the L.A. subway. But, again, I mean, I think there's a certain surreal quality that the that the story has. So I hope that, you know, this doesn't, like, take you out of the movie because it's obviously so not America at this point. But in my mind, this is kind of like the third man sequence of The Machinist, you know, he's... He chased through these dark, these dark corridors and through these dark tunnels, and um, it has a little bit of the film noir vibe to it. Originally in Scott's script, Trevor Rant runs into the actual into the actual subway tunnel itself and kind of pins himself against the wall as the subway rushes by and sort of escapes that way, but. I wanted him to go even deeper. I like the idea of him literally becoming this kind of underground man. So we devised a way that he could get into these, into what is actually here. You're watching the, the Barcelona sewage uh, tunnels. We did a tour of them when we were scouting for the movie, and uh, I was just so taken by the look. And the, I mean, it's obviously not something you probably find in America, but it just seemed to capture the... Uh, you know the the state of mind of this guy at this point. He's literally wa- running through these dripping, rat-infested tunnels. So we devised a way that he could get from the subway station into these tunnels by having him pull up that that uh, that, that little grate in the floor and dropping down into the sub tunnels. And here again, like I was saying earlier, the the, the notion of these sort of crossroads. Which way is he going to go, left or right? This was kind of funny. I mean, his choice is A or B. I mean, what difference does it make? But he basically runs away from... He goes down into the dark tunnel. Into the darkness. If you look closely at that cop car, you'll see that it's... It's something that looks like it came off off the the show Adam-12. They don't really have modern, contemporary-looking American prop police cars in Barcelona, so they had these really old-looking ones from, like, the 1960s. This was another scene we shot at that abandoned mental hospital north of Barcelona, which had these beautiful corridors with wood-paneled corridors, you know, again, totally uh, condemned building, but these wonderfully architecturally designed corridors from, like, the 1920s and 30s. Crossing the street, lights changed on me. Did he stop? I mean, really, this is a story about a guy who's 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 paying penance for his crime by kind of going through the same the motions that uh, of becoming the victim. You know, he's he kind of victimizes himself over the course of. Uh, his journey to, f- to figure out what's what's wrong with him. Um, you know, he gets hit by a car. He's, you know, uh, 
know. He's literally you know, kind of falling apart before our very eyes. It's a sweet scene, too. I think these, these couple scenes between uh, Trevor and Stevie um, are, the one, are the few places in the movie that uh, get a little access into the human being behind this emaciated shell, you know? You kind of want it. You want things to work out for the guy, and I think that that was something I liked about the script. Is as repugnant as this character was, there was also something highly sympathetic about him and likable about him, and or at the very least, you wanted you wanted it all to work out. You wanted you almost want to kind of give him a big hug, make him feel better, because <laughs> he's just he just seems so miserable and so tormented. And I think Stevie's role in this movie is she's sort of like the safe harbor. She's the place that he goes to to seek solace, and particularly in a scene like this where she's literally bathing him, you know, I mean, um, putting balm on his wounds. The, 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 there was a scene earlier of him in the corridor when he falls down and she runs over and, and cradles him, which in my mind was like, it was an accident, but if you look at it, it's like almost an exact uh, analog to the Pieta, the, Pieta the, the statue of Mary holding the dying Jesus. <laughs> There's a bit of a, a Christ complex that this character has. Even the poster for the movie had this kind of crucifix shadow on it, which, I don't know, it's all, it's all unintentional, of course. This is a difficult scene just because of of where it had to go, you know. We had to go from Trevor thinking he's finally found a safe place to suddenly triggering his his uh, his paranoia again and, and having him just lash out at this woman who only wants to only wants to kind of comfort him and and love him, you know. It's it's real. This is sort of the tragic aspect of Trevor Resnick's story. And it's twisted if you think that what he's really looking at here is a picture of himself that Stevie lovingly framed and put by her bedside as a testament to her affection for him I mean you know and now he's going to use it in his in, he's going to use it as evidence against her which is tragic um. this is uh, probably the most difficult scene for Christian as well because it was so intense physically and emotionally intense and this was you know towards the end of the shoot and he was really exhausted I mean he lost weight he continued to lose weight as we were making the movie I think a bit so he was tired and this was not easy for him by any stretch uh, just the physicality of it um, I think we, but when we did a numerous and we did a lot of coverage of this scene, and by the end of it, he was just like he was like on the floor, like just exhausted. He couldn't even stand up. He just let it all out, you know. I don't know what you're talking about, baby. Ah, don't baby me. Yeah, baby. I'll change my whole fucking life for you. I'll do anything you want, baby. Talking about a guy who's just sabotaging his what did you do? his life here, you know. Just from my wallet, were proposing to me. Fuck you! You left it in my tip jar the other night. Bullshit! I thought you wanted me to have it. I cut the crap. Steve. I mean, that was always a stretch for me a bit. The idea that he just happened to leave it in her tip jar. And I kind of at one point wanted to have a scene where we might where we established that maybe he could have done that to make it a little more plausible. But we just lived with it. It's a bit of a... It's one of those coincidental moments in a story that you just have to get away with, I guess. I'm looking at a picture of you standing 
next to some fat guy with glasses holding a fish. Here comes that lovely theremin. That's lovely. Spooky and sad all at the same time. Trevor. It's you. Look. Lying You get the fuck out. Fucking free. You bet I fucking will! Yeah. You Please. fucking whore! Oh. You're a fucking freak! Now I know why you're afraid of doctors, because you're a fucking psycho! <laughs> this sequence, uh... I don't know, just always struck me as being kind of like a... Some 1940s film noir montage thing, you know, like the character remembering these bits from earlier, and you still see him on frame on the on the left there. And now he, now in his mind, he's putting it all together. Stevie, you know, she, she and I have been conspiring against me the whole time. Now we're back at the that airport coffee shop but as you can see the, the look of the place is a much dirtier more real because it is now uh, place you know just dirty dishes and even the pie that he got in the first scene just looks so edible and yeah. and tasty now it's like wrapped in cheap plastic it's just a crappy piece of pie they pulled out of the out of the you know the refrigerator uh and you know, here's here's the real waitress in her in her food stained uniform, and now of course there's dozens of people milling about. It's just you know, it's a whole different uh, airport coffee shop. It's not the airport coffee shop of his dreams. It's it's the real thing. Maria, the name. I mean, you know. How would he have known her name? I mean, how would he have known the name of the boy Nicholas? And those aren't the real names. I mean, presumably he wouldn't know their names. He he hits the boy and flees the scene of the crime. It's a hit and run accident. So how does he know who these people are? But we thought we needed to give her a name. Like, what, how does he refer to her? So uh, anyhow, our our idea is that our idea was that the names that he gives them were names from the book The Idiot that we see him reading earlier in the story the Dostoevsky novel so the name Marie and the name Nicholas were two characters in The Idiot uh, and that kind of became our justification for how he could have how, how he could apply names to these two characters since he doesn't know who they are um, I mean he, he, his only impression of the two of them are from fleeting glimpses he has of them just after the accident. Other than that, he has no relationship with them other than the one he's created in his delusional, sleep-deprived mind. I know that I just love the, I don't know, this old-fashioned kind of dissolve, montage dissolving one image into the next, but like I said earlier, I, I just wanted the movie to have more of a... Um, I don't know, like, a, a, not a contemporary hip uh, feel to it. I wanted it to feel like something that could have been made in the, you know, the late 40s or early 50s or something. Don't forget your post-its. This, to me, was one of the creepier images in the movie is when you? he's thinking that Stevie's going to step out of that car. You know, and then when the boy steps out, in my mind, it's just really spooky. It's this is the one piece of score that I wasn't really happy with. I just think it's too too on the nose in terms of capturing his his shock. You know, but it's followed by what I like, what I think is one of the better bits of score. This this kind of really slow, uh, dreamy uh, bit here with the with the Hammond organ in the background, <laughs> which is kind of feels like it's from some 
old soap opera. Now we're getting into um, the scene where Trevor confronts Ivan. It's one of the few scenes we we rehearsed. We didn't do a lot of rehearsal in general. I don't tend to do that in the films I've done. I, but this was a scene that you ought to pay it could have been played in so many different ways. You know, how much, how menacing should Ivan be? Um, how much of the clown? should he be in this scene versus how much of a real threat he should he should seem to be so it was trying to find that balance plus there was the the logistics of this little fight they have this little s- scrum they have on the bathroom floor um, those are always the hardest bits to shoot I think because how do you make him look real and you know of course what we realize by the end is that this isn't a real scramble they have right here it's uh it's it's trevor wrestling with himself some people have pointed out the comparison with the fight club you know which has a similar premise i suppose a guy who who makes up this imaginary kind of alter ego character um but uh you know i I think in that movie, the the reveal at the end when you re, when you re, when you reveal that Ed Norton, uh, that Brad Pitt, is just a figment of Ed Norton's imagination. In my mind, it just came out of nowhere. Whereas in this movie, I think it's set up a number of different places in the story. So at the end, when you realize that Ivan doesn't exist, it's pretty. You, you already kind of know it. <laughs> the posture of his body here looks so fake. Here's my little psycho tribute, I suppose. Scott likes to describe the movie as if Hitchcock, uh, you know, as the last movie Hitchcock would have ever made, which I think is some pretty, pretty, a pretty bold statement. But you know, we certainly were influenced by Hitchcock. I'll say that. I think there are a lot of, but that was in the script, you know, and um, so I tried to capture that in making the movie as well. Here we finally reveal what the heck is in that refrigerator. Um, I don't know if this totally paid off in the end. The idea is that when he opens the top, we're expecting to see what, you know, I don't know, the corpse of the little boy fall out. Um, I guess that's what he's expecting to see. But what it is is it's just all the stuff that's been in his freezer and this fish, this filleted fish, which is the fish that he caught with his friend when they went on their fishing trip, the fish that's in the photograph that we've seen, the tuna, or whatever the heck it is. Um, It's that fish. That's the idea. So it's just a fake out, you know. Um, But it tells us this. It tells us that, in fact, it's Trevor in that photo. That was difficult. I I I wasn't sure whether to show that or not. And originally it was when we pan up the photo, we reveal Ivan, and we just see the same photo we've seen, Ivan and Reynolds, the co-worker, But at that point, you know, we needed to, I think, show the audience that uh, Trevor uh, was in that photo. The problem is that it undermines this reveal, I think. Um, you're, at this point, you're, you're certain that Ivan's not going to be in that in that rug and that this character who's pointing the f- light is going to be Ivan. You've got some explaining to do, partner. <laughs> See, now we're back at the beginning of the movie, so. This is one, I like this, I thought this reveal of, uh, of Ivan, uh, coming up here worked rather nicely. The original post-it note that he looks at in the script, it, it, it said, you're dead. That was what this post-it note was supposed to have said, but in my mind, it, it seemed a little too ambiguous like what does that mean people are going to people are going to guess that Trevor is dead and this whole thing is 
kind of like The Sixth Sense or something, where he realizes that he's dead. It's one of those kind of movies. But So I changed it to you. Who Are You? Because that seemed to be, in my mind, the more fundamental question. Who is this guy? He's asking that question. The audience is asking that question. And it's revealed at the end when he fills in the, the final clue, the post-it note clue. Killer. He's a killer. He finally puts the pieces together. So, And here's where... Um, where it all comes together. This is the pivotal final flashback. All the little details, the clues we'd seen earlier, the 1.30, the time of the accident, the, the cigarette lighter popping out, the reason for the accident, the 66 medallion, which feeds into the, the final Route 666 ride that he goes on, and then, of course, the boy that he kills, and the red firebird. Uh, we realize that it's his car. Um, it was the car in which he killed the boy. You are. And then finally, uh, we see the man himself, pre-accident, and how healthy and he looks, and you know the realization that he goes from that to the the skeletal, emaciated, tormented character he, he becomes is, in my mind, the most horrific, tragic aspect of the story. Just prior to that, you saw the water tower, the signifier that tells us that this is the intersection where the accident occurred, and those fleeting images he has of Marie and Nicholas, or the, the mother and the, the son, are the only images he, he has of those two characters that feed into and inform all the earlier scenes we saw, uh, the delusional scenes with those two characters. And here finally, ultimately, Trevor, like the audience hopefully, figures out the solution to the puzzle and he fills in the final piece as it were with a black marker like um, like we've seen all the other post-it notes uh, you know uh, that we saw earlier in the story were written with this black thick black marker and now we know that it was his marker all along that he created these post-it notes almost as a subconscious way to uh, to somehow trigger his, his memory of the event. And now we, we, when we see him packing, the question is, well, is he, what's he going to do now? You know, is he uh, going to do what he's been doing all along in some ways? Um, is he going to do what he did just in the aftermath of the accident and run away from his responsibilities and flee the, the scene of the crime? Is that why he's packing his bag? What's Trevor going to do? And um, now that we're back in reality and he's conscious of what of his crime, it really comes down to um, is he going to pay the consequences or is he going to just keep running away? Here we, we have a couple references to these objects we saw earlier in Marie's apartment, the turntable, the clown figure, and the crystal bowl. Um, kind of telling us, I guess, that he took these things and planted them into those earlier hallucinations, you know. Um, and he's aware of it now, you know. And it, you can see the kind of horror on his own face. So here, the, the, uh, the sort of penultimate scene of Trevor in his truck on the road. Where is he going? And this is the final kind of fork in the road for Trevor. There are earlier uh, bits, you know, in the subway and such where he had to make a choice. And here's here he's going to make his final choice. And Ivan is there to kind of ask him the question, what are you going to do, man? Are you going to go to the airport and run away or continue to run? Or are you going to do the right thing and pay the price for your crime, you know? Here we have this shot which is framed in such a way that we don't know where we are. It could be the airport. It could be the terminal at the airport. We even had a little, we even put put in a little airport sound there to kind of make it seem like it could be. Here's Ivan wishing Trevor, you know, happy travels. Um, but in what sense? Is he going to go and get on a f flight and fly to Mexico and run away from his crime, or is he going to pay the price? And here we finally realize that I'd like to report a hit and run. he's going to pay the price. And finally, here in this this white, pure, kind of bleached out holding cell area, 
Trevor is We're need to record your statements. finally kind of uh, arrived uh, at the end of his long journey. There's a there's kind of this bleach motif through the story, I guess. You know, the idea of him washing his hands with bleach, trying to kind of rid himself of his guilt. And here he's finally um, arrived in this all-white, bleached-out room. And finally, thankfully, is able to shut his eyes. And for the first time in a year or so, is able to sleep. And the last image, just in the aftermath of the hit and run, here we see him again as he's going into the dark tunnel, into the darkness, and ultimately emerging into the bright, bleached out white, almost like his memory is being bleached away here. And what will ensue will be the next year of hell for him, really, as he tries to figure out and remember the accident. I'm Brad Anderson, and thanks for watching.